Welcome to another special topical episode of Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government law and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. Happy New Year and all good things to you and yours in 2023. For many of us, the last several years, and especially the January 6th coup attempt, have felt unprecedented. I personally can't remember another time of such singular threat to American democracy and such a singularly flawed or even wicked president. That's where historians come in. The best American historians can not only identify the antecedents to the days we're living through, but can explain what historical forces account for the country's heavy flirtation with authoritarianism and what forces might combine to pull us out of the quicksand. And the best American historians is certainly an apt description of the three guests for this special topical episode of Talking Feds. So, to put our royal times in historical context and discuss their causes and consequences, it's an honor to welcome three of the most eminent scholars and social critics in the country. And they are... Heather Cox Richardson, a historian and history professor at Boston College, where she teaches 19th century American history. She previously taught at MIT and University of Massachusetts Amherst. In her extensive writing, she's covered the Civil War, Reconstruction, the political forces surrounding the Wounded Knee Massacre, and the evolution of the Republican Party. Her most recent book, How the South Won the Civil War was released earlier this year. Her terrific, really terrific daily Substack newsletter, Letters from an American, chronicles current events in the larger context of American history. She's also co-host of the Now and Then podcast, which helps to explain current events also through historical lens. Heather Cox Richardson, thank you very much for being here today. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Eddie Gloud? My regular, it seems to be, co-guest on Deadline White House, but a frequent guest on MSNBC, is the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor and Chair of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University. He's also the former president of the American Academy of Religion, a columnist for Time Magazine, and as I mentioned, a regular contributor for MSNBC. His many books include Begin Again, James Baldwin's America, which won the 2021 Stowe Prize, and his six-part audio documentary, History is Us, or History is U.S., published earlier this year, examines the history of race in America and what it reveals about our current times. I listened to it in preparation for today's episode, and it is awesome. Eddie Gloud, thank you so much for being on this episode. It's a pleasure. And finally, Eric Foner, the DeWitt Clinton Professor Emeritus of History at Columbia University, where he specializes in the Civil War, Reconstruction, and 19th century America. He has served as the president of the Organization of American Historians, American Historical Society, and Society of American Historians and is the most frequently cited author on college history syllabi. I don't know how they assemble that figure, but it's he. Serves on the editorial boards of Past and Present and The Nation, and one of his many, many books, The Fiery Trial, Abraham Lincoln and American Slavery, which also, I'm a modest reader of Lincoln books, and this should be on the top of everyone's list, The Fiery Trial, Abraham Lincoln and American Slavery won the Bancroft, Lincoln, and Pulitzer Prizes in 2011. Professor Foner, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks very much for inviting me. All right, let me set up the discussion a bit. So when we conceived of this episode, I saw it as an exploration of whether the last several years in this country, including the insurrection, were basically without precedent which it feels to many as if that's the case. I think in preparing for this episode, though, I now understand that nobody here would endorse that view. 
And I'm thinking we may be able to set it to the side and take on some more interesting questions that it strike me follow from it. But let me be sure. So just to serve it up, are we in fact living in a singular era in the history of American democracy? I would give you a good historian's answer, which is yes and no. (laughs) That's also a lawyer's answer, Professor. Yeah, I mean, obviously, every moment or period of history has its own specific qualities and implications. Despite what some people like to say, history never quite repeats itself exactly. But the fact is that what we're living through now is very reminiscent, to say the least, of other eras of American history, particularly to my mind, but this because I guess I study it, the era of civil war and reconstruction. Many of the issues that are on our national agenda right at this minute are reconstruction issues from after the civil war, who should be a citizen, who should have the right to vote, questions like that. And certainly armed mobs trying to overthrow democratically elected governments whether at the national or state or local level, is certainly not uh, unique in American history and occurred quite a few times in the era of Reconstruction and afterwards. So there are many parallels, and I think the parallels are very instructive about the moment we're living in and some of its historical antecedents. I would certainly concur with Professor Foner. I think it's singular insofar as we're experiencing it. That is to say, you know, philosophically, we weren't present in the previous historical moment, so it's unique and distinctive insofar as to particular actors. But in terms of the themes, in terms of the contradictions, in terms of the conflicts deeply rooted in American history, not only am I thinking about, as, as Professor Foner alludes to, is the period of the Civil War and Reconstruction, but I'm also thinking about the period of the 1920s, right? I'm thinking about the context that framed the passage of the Immigration Act of 1924 and the way in which uh, race and nativism and ideas of American identity animated our politics in very, very uh, troublesome ways. So yes and no. Yes and no. Absolutely. Well, and I'm going to agree as well, but add something that makes this moment slightly different, I think, and would love to hear especially what Professor Foner has to say about this. And that is that while I think the themes that we are living through right now reach not only back to Reconstruction, a field in which Professor Foner himself interested me, but all the way back to our founding and before. So while there are themes that go along throughout our history that we are reliving now, what seems to me to make this moment unique is that for the first time in American history, we have a significant body of a major political party that does not believe in the Democratic project. That is, in the past, we've certainly had people like that sitting in Congress, sitting in state legislatures, sitting in local government. They tended to be expelled when they were discovered to be working against the American government. In this case, we have not only left them where they are, but they're about to ascend to positions of of importance in our government again. And I don't think we know how something like that's going to play out. Yeah, let me just agree with what Professor Richard just said. It is somewhat unique at the moment that we do have powerful people and significant segments of a major political party which reject many aspects of the whole principle of democracy. The parallel to that in our past might not immediately occur to our mind, but the Federalist Party Mm -hmm. right after the revolution is the only political party I can think of that sort of did disdain democracy. This is a long time ago and was validly in favor of rule by elites rather than by voting uh, citizens. But, you know, look what happened to them. They didn't last very long. The culture was already sort of pro-democratic, you might say, pro-democracy, even though the founding fathers can't really be characterized as believers in political democracy. If you read the Constitution, it's not a very democratic document. But yes, I think what Professor Richardson said, and in fact, I'm going to call her Heather from now on, if that's all right, because I've known her and admired her for so long, it feels funny to say Professor Richardson. (laughs) If you'll permit me to go first names, let's all go first names. Okay. That sounds great. Absolutely. Let me qualify this just a bit, just add one footnote. It seems to me we don't need to go all the way back to the Federalist era. 
we can actually go to the South and go to Copperhead, right? There are those who have a, an idea of democracy that is so circumscribed by the idea of race, by the reality of race, that they're willing to actually throw it away uh, in the name of defending the institution of slavery, in the name of defending the idea that certain people, because of the color of their skin, ought to be valued more than others. So I think it's very important for us to see that the idea of America as a truly multiracial democracy has only really existed since 1965 in some way. And that and it was hotly contested then. So I think Heather's point is absolutely right, but I don't even think we need to go all the way back to the Federalists. I think we can go back to those forces that led to the Civil War, where we see our entire region and its allies willing to throw democracy into the trash bin in, in, in defense of a particular way of, of understanding the country. I agree with that. And the reason I put the caveats I did around mm -hmm. that was to say that I think you have to recognize that between, you know, 1874 and 1965, the South was not a democracy. It was, you know, an authoritarian region. But in the national government and Congress, the people in Congress were still willing to protect the idea of representation and being able to elect the people that constructed your government. And the fact that we now have people sitting in Congress who are articulately saying that this is not something that they any longer believe in, you know, puts my hair on fire. And the idea that we're just sort of saying, oh, well, you know, the texts to Mark Meadows from literally sitting members of Congress, well, that's just the way they talk. Or the sorts of things that we're hearing from the former president or some of his acolytes saying, you know, we have to burn it all down, we have to overturn the election, all the things they're saying, and that that is currently passing as acceptable political discourse in our country is... Again, the real comparison is something like 1878, 1879, when the former Confederates did, in fact, get control of the House of Representatives and after 1878, the Senate as well. And they tried to do the same thing and the American people tossed them out on their heels. And that was the last you heard of the Confederates determining what was going to happen in the Democratic Party. After that, they're going to turn to the northern cities. And the corruption, and I mean literally the corruption of the body politic in Congress at this moment strikes me as being something that brings together all these old historic through lines, but brings them to a new and catastrophic point. Well, I think that's a really important point. And it strikes me as not, I say anything in this episode with some trepidation, but not only, not only acceptable, but really triumphant. The actual propaganda of some of the elected officials is, is really sort of embracing. And it does seem to me also, just Professor Foner's point about Federalists and Anti-Federalists, that one kind of overlap is I think both this sort of Anti-Federalists and now some of the MAGA right present themselves in some way as the true patriots and by implication it's the current state of affairs that's gone awry. But let me follow up on your point, Heather, and ask this way about the current period. With the possible exception of the Civil War, is this the most precarious that it's been in our history? Well, I hate to go all historian on you here, but yeah. I'm going to throw this back actually to Eddie's point. And that is that, yes, at a national level, we are truly at a catastrophe. But I suspect if you lived in the American South from the beginning until 1965, it didn't look so ducky. And not only not so ducky, but literally that the whole project was at potential risk of teetering and collapsing? Well, I mean, I think what we're getting at here in all of these comments is the essential contradiction, which does go back right to the founding era, if not yeah. before, which is a rhetoric of democracy and indeed belief in democracy on the part of many, many people. And yet, it being in the simplest form, you know, constrained by race. White Southerners before the Civil War thought they lived in a democracy, most of them. But of course, African Americans were completely excluded from that. In other words, you get to the point where who is entitled to be a part of this democracy? And as Heather said, from almost all of our history, 
and particularly in the South, African Americans was deemed to be just not qualified or not able or inherently just not suited for participation in democratic uh, politics. So white people, particularly in the South, but not entirely, held these ideas together, you know, to what seemed to be contradictory ideas. It all gets back to who are the people of the United States? The, the words that begin the Constitution, yeah. we the people. Democracies suggest that the people are deciding fundamental questions, but who are they? And somehow we have this system which has lasted for centuries where many people feel that a large part of the population are not really part or not really desirous as part of the people of the United States. Ed, Eddie has written about this, of course. Mm. So that's part of the problem of analysis here. People believe in democracy and in exclusion at the same time. Therefore, they can say, well, we're a democracy, even though only white people are voting here. Well, that's because black people are just not part of the democracy, actually, folks. Today, we don't have people quite putting it that way, but their actions certainly suggest that they don't feel that African-American voters, let's say, are quite as legitimate. The demands for even a simpler thing like the demands for recounts of the electoral results in African-American areas like parts of, you know, let's say Milwaukee, not in white, mostly white areas, those votes seem to be fine. So, you know, that kind of outlook is still out there, although perhaps not quite as uh, in as virulent a form as it has been in other points in our history. Right. You know, I'm thinking about de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, you know, and you, you have one of the most insightful accounts of, of American democratic life ever written. And of course, then you have the three races chapter, which he says, I've dealt with the issue of democracy. Now I'm going to turn to this as if these issues aren't intimately connected. As Eric says, this question of who constitutes the we, who are we, right, is, is this vexing question that has haunted this fragile experiment. And in this current moment, right now, what we're grappling with, right, is this idea of who are we? There are some among us who believe that they're losing control of the country. And so you hear great replacement theory driving the way in which people are thinking about the political process and, and animating policy positions around immigration, animating the kinds of debates and arguments we're having around the stories we tell ourselves about who we are. And that contradiction has been present since our birth. And it has been inflamed, I mean, to use the phrase that Lincoln used on the floor of the House of Representatives in some ways, this fever dream spiked periodically in the country. And so it's it's a through line. It's not the same, but it's the through line of our national history. I just got to speak up here and add gender to the mix as well. Absolutely. Because while certainly there is the exclusion of people of color and Black Americans, there has always sort of been an assumption that women didn't count at all. And one of the reasons I think we're seeing what we're seeing today is exactly what we saw in the Reconstruction era, but what the elite enslavers talked about before the Civil War as well. And that is the idea that if you let people of color, black Americans and women actually have a say in their government, they're going to vote for that government to actually do things and actually level the playing field. And that's opened the door for people to say, well, they're not true Americans then because the government shouldn't do any of those things. I would say we're actually at an extraordinarily virulent moment for that argument. You know, what I'm hearing here is not simply the parallels between our current troubled times and specific instances in U.S. history, but more broadly over the whole sweep of the country, it sounds like all of you would reject the self-congratulatory hypothesis that sometime in the last hundred years, maybe 1945, maybe 1965, maybe 1989, but you know, the country came into the sun in a permanent way and free market democracy or the U.S. model prevailed in some stable, lasting way. I think it's not simply the aberrant periods, but the entire sweep of U.S. history that everyone is suggesting has been seen in a distorted light. Is that fair? Yes. I think if one were going to say what you began by saying, that in 1945 mm -hmm. or 1965 or some other year, we sort of solved all these problems and became a truly functioning democracy, most of us, I think, here would probably say that's a gross oversimplification. 
I'm not one of those who sort of says, well, nothing ever changes, you know, yeah. slavery still exists. I, I think it's important, particularly for scholars, to be pretty precise about what they are actually talking about. There has been progress and change, pretty obviously, I think. On the other hand, these deeply rooted contradictions continue, as we've been saying, in American public life. So uh, I don't think we can sit back and congratulate ourselves that now we don't have to worry anymore about the fate of our democracy, as Heather described it a few minutes ago. There are still a lot of worrisome tendencies. In fact, you know, too many people, friends of mine or others, seem to have sat back and relaxed after the midterm elections and said, oh, okay, uh, things are pretty much under control now. The so-called red wave didn't happen. I don't think the end of this problem and debate and conflict has been reached yet. Let's just put it that way. If I may jump in on that and speak to what Eric just said, and that is, of course, democracy has always been a work in progress. But I think one of the reasons we have ended up where we are in part is because we assumed that it was going to be taken for granted. This is the way America was going to be. In 1960, there's a very famous article written by political scientist Phil Converse who says, you know, there's really no point in trying to rally people around principles any longer because we all agree on the liberal consensus. End of history, right? Yes, yes, that's right. And this is the way it's going to be from here on. And what that did is it permitted the rise of an authoritarian, or not the rise of, of an authoritarian impulse, because I actually think that's always been there. It enabled the articulation of an authoritarian impulse through a very simple narrative that offered people a real sense of meaning with their votes and with their lives. And that theme, that idea that America was really about the individual little guy fighting back against an empire rather than being about leveling the playing field and creating a community that was the best for the most people, really took over our political sphere and our cultural sphere and ultimately our economic sphere as well. And that has given us what some observers from Scandinavia have called fascist entertainment in which we have reality TV in which the, the, you know, the best person is supposed to squish everybody else. The lionization of the men who appear to be incredibly wealthy men and the idea of a politics in which a few senators, for example, do whatever they want and rule everybody else and family relations in which men are supposed to dictate to their children and wives. And that is a political and an ideological position that is really different than where we were from 1942 or so to 1980. Let me ask as a follow-up then to Eddie or Eric, what role does a figure like Trump play in these developments? Is the sort of sense that someone's always there lurking and if the forces come together, the charismatic or villainous figure will just be there and arise? Or do you think that if you try to do the counterfactual where he stayed in the movies or whatever, <laughs> Hitler became a painter, do these things not happen? I think you can go back to Herodotus or one of those old guys. Right. If you want to debate this, what is the role of the individual in history, if you want to put it that way? Historians have been mowing this over for a long, long time. Yeah. I tend to be skeptical of rules of which apply to all of history. The only rule that is valuable that applies to all of history is actually an optimistic one, which is this too will pass. Mm -hmm. Change is essential to the study of history. Maybe even more if this is your view, the Enlightenment, the Pinker book view that and not just will pass, but will little by little spasmodically improve. Then you just have to raise the question of what are the circumstances that enable a right. charismatic uh, quasi-fascist person to become a leader and to mobilize an electoral victory, as Trump was able to do a few years ago. There are plenty of aspiring, you know, petty tyrants in American history who didn't quite get there. My uh, late good friend and colleague, Alan Brinkley, you know, wrote a long time ago about Huey Long and Father right. Coughlin other demagogues of the 1930s, and they reached a point where they, you know, they were very dangerous and connected in some ways with fascism, etc., but they reached a point of where they couldn't go further. 
So in a way, the question is, why, why have the institutional barriers to a sort of semi-fascist leader emerging and, you know, and succeeding? Why have those barriers seem to have weakened so much? I think that's a great question. One way in which I've approached your question, Harry, is to think about it in this way. I'll use this physiological example, right? That is to say, imagine that you have diabetes. There's something already inherently wrong with the system, and then there's an injection of sugar. And what happens? It's thrown out of balance, right? So I tend to read the contradictions that we've been describing up to now have been a part of the American landscape. And then you'll get a figure. It's almost like a dose of sugar that then spikes, and then we have these problems, as it were. And one way to read it is optimistically change will inevitably happen. This too will pass, but it's not necessarily the case that it will pass for the good or for the bad. So, so there's that. And then there are these elements about our political system that has really exacerbated the, the context in which this, this happens, right? So not only the, the role of corporate money, the, the kind of erosion of the public good, the crisis of political institutions, whether it's a gerrymandered house, imperial presidency, a broken judiciary in some ways, the Senate that is no longer the greatest deliberative body in the country, a fourth estate that has been captured in some ways as well. The kind of confluence, the convergence of these factors, I think, exacerbate right, what seems to have happened or seems to be a part of our history from the beginning, if, if that makes sense. No, it does. And reflecting my own bias, I, I wonder about Eric and Heather's thoughts about what you've just called the broken judiciary. In other words, what role do courts tend to play in these particular periods? And how do you see the current Supreme Court as being congruent or not with the role of courts in previous times? Well, you know, people like my, of my age who grew up with the Warren Court sort of imbibed an, an idea that the Supreme Court was the most progressive branch right. of government and was the institution that was going to solve deep problems that the uh, legislature and the president couldn't solve. But that was all a mistake. I mean, that is to say that that's a misconception. The Supreme Court and other branches of the judiciary are the most conservative branches of government. They serve for life. They're not elected. They don't have to listen to public sentiment, et cetera, et cetera. And they were intended that way, to keep a, a lid on popular enthusiasms of one kind or another. So I think we still, people on the, let's say, liberal left, still have a kind of nostalgia for the old Warren court, but without quite realizing how exceptional it was, how unusual it was. And in fact, over the long course, let's say since the end of slavery, many of the aspects of weakening democracy were approved by the Supreme Court or were implemented by the Supreme Court over the course of the 1890s and early 20th century. The Supreme Court gave its imprimatur to the Jim Crow system, which was being put into place, which was totally undemocratic. But the court bought into the idea that African Americans were somehow not quite true members of the society. So Right now, the court is out of control, no question about it. And that poses a serious problem for those who want to change the direction of American politics, because the Supreme Court is there to try to stop that. What will happen on that front, I don't even want to predict, but it could lead to some kind of deep crisis down the road. There's very little that I can add that people like Harry and Eric have not already added to the discussion about the Supreme Court. But I would like to point out that the idea that justices stay in office until they go toes up is a very new one. You know, it's a reflection of modern transportation and modern medicine. And it, it, the idea that you're supposed to be there forever is new. And the other piece that I think we really ought to have in front of us is that it's the Supreme Court that took on itself the right to decide what was constitutional in 1803 with Marbury versus Madison. So the idea that we all have to sort of sit pinned against the wall as nine people decide the way we live our lives is really a constructed idea that is not rooted in our Constitution. And the reason I mention those things is because I agree with Eddie. I think his analogy of diabetes, the idea that there is a problem with the body politic and there always has been, I think is something that we have to have on the table. But now the next piece for me, and I know for a lot of people in America, is what do we do? 
Like, how do we address that? I do want to move there. I'll just add, however contingent you would say the institution is, I do think it's now very much baked in. Eddie mentioned democracy in America and Tocqueville. You know, I think he said every political or social problem becomes a legal one. I do think all the doomsday scenarios, and they're real, do pass through the U.S. Supreme Court for us in a way that, you know, in other countries it might be, say, the military. But you can really imagine their enabling a parade of horribles and and not acting independently. Before going to, you know, 2022, again, looking on the arc of history, what have been the factors that have tended to pull the country back from the brink? What do the lessons of history instruct as far as when we get out of the woods? Well, I think sort of belief in the constitutional system, flawed as it is, has been a barrier to the implementation of the most uh, anti-democratic impulses in American history. However, it is always important, uh, without becoming uh, tedious about it, to bear in mind what Eddie and Heather have said, that if you ask those questions from an African-American perspective, you're going to get a very different answer. You know, when did there really exist a significant democracy? for black people in this country. During Reconstruction, yes, but that was a most important period, but it didn't last very long. Maybe more recently since when the Voting Rights Act was enacted, but the Voting Rights Act has been pretty much repealed by the Supreme Court in the past uh, few years. So, you know, I think we have to bear in mind that there's always been this anti-democratic element in our society, whether it's the institution of slavery, the overthrow of Reconstruction and the imposition of Jim Crow, the long period of disenfranchisement, et cetera, et cetera. And so we can't really ask the question, (laughs) what has enabled democracy to survive without always bearing in mind that the democracy has been flawed from the very beginning? You know, that's a, a serious critique of our political history, let's say. And then you have these these moments, what I like to think of as the eruption of the possible, moments when what America could be or can be kind of comes into view when people from across a variety of different positions or, or sectors, you can imagine at one point, Tom Watson was actually defending black farmers before he became the most one of the most virulent racists that we've ever seen in Georgia, right? The moments in abolition where we saw extraordinary solidarity and coalitions across groups. You know, you think about Frederick Douglass and his advocation for the rights of women. And so there there are moments when people step outside of their silos and offer a vision of the country and organize in light of that vision and their breakthrough, whether it's for workers and and the like. I can just go down the line. There's replete with examples that have gotten us this far. But Again, to echo Eric's point, it it requires, I think, a kind of a monumental leap of the imagination of what we could be, as opposed to just simply instantiating what we think we are. It's always reaching for the possible as opposed to instantiating who we think we are. I think that's a little abstract, but I can make that a little bit clearer as we continue to talk. I actually think you made it very clear. And I think you're absolutely right. When you think of people like Fannie Lou Hamer registering people to vote in Mississippi and managing it is a vision of hope and a vision of democracy that I think actually lives in marginalized peoples because the idea of democracy is something that they don't have so they can aspire to it. But the thing that keeps me up when we talk about this is it feels like every time that impulse changes our laws to try and level the playing field, we erase that. And historians of the American West make a real point about the fact that this happens in the American West and economic issues all the time. That is, the people who are exploiting the resources in the West as cattle ranchers or as agricultural people or whatever end up getting themselves in a terrible problem, the Dust Bowl or the terrible deaths on the plains in the 1880s of the cattle. And then they turn to the federal government. And the federal government says, okay, well, you got to plant less less fields and you got to limit your herds and we'll manage to get this back on an even keel. And they do that. 
And the minute that the economy in the West looks fine again, they say, get out of my face. We don't need the federal government. And that rubber band of we need you, we don't need you, we need you, we don't need you. I don't know how we pull that out of our political sphere. Ah, such a great question. I mean, that story is almost like the story of the founding of Texas, isn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> always. Eric's written that our history is not a <laughs> Whiggish saga of greater and greater freedom, but a more complicated story of rights gained and rights taken away. But, you know, it strikes me, and this is largely from your work, Eddie, that part of what, I mean, we're both looking forward, but also backwards. And it, it feels, I wonder if you think this is cogent, that part of what's happening now is almost a national argument about race and implicit retrenchment from a social commitment to racial equality. But it's almost, you know, just today, the uh, Congress voted to replace the statue of Roger Taney with one of Thurgood Marshall in the Supreme Court building, speaking of the rubber band and the back and forth. But I think part of what's happening is an actual argument and two very sort of contested positions about the history of race in the country, the South, and all those things. Obviously, they're not the combatants are not citing the Voting Rights Act and this and that, but it feels like they're staking a claim about the meaning of culture and history. Does that make sense? No, it does. I mean, I think there's a direct relationship between the debates around immigration, the attack on voting rights, the insurrection of January 6th, the arguments we've been having around critical race theory and 1619 Project and 1776 Commission. All of this is about who do we take ourselves to be? In the face of demographic shifts, the browning of America is not something that's happening in the distant future. We've already seen its implication in our politics. We see it on the, in our commercials. We see it in the kind of popular cultural forms. And all sorts of anxieties and panic and terror are being expressed, uh, causing reverberations throughout the body politic and throughout, in some ways, our neighborhoods, our communities, our families and the like. And we can't stick our heads in the sand. To use another analogy, I guess I'm using too many analogies today, but, you know, when you're a boxer, you can take a punch on the tin when you're young. America, you know, in its early days, we could deal with these contradictions and take it on the chin and get back up on our feet. But, you know, we might be a bit punch drunk when it comes to these questions. And the concern is whether or not we can bounce back and democracy can hold in the face of this contradiction evidencing itself once again and people who are willing to throw away the whole damn thing again in defense of this idea that america must look a certain way and certain people must be valued more than others all right it is now time for a spirited debate Brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thanks, Harry. Today's spirited debate centers around a recipe for a timeless cocktail from the 1800s, the Old Fashioned, where the question still stands whether to use rye whiskey or bourbon. The original recipe calls for bourbon, so we've already scored one point for bourbon there. As for the specific brand, the rule of thumb is if you wouldn't sip it by itself, it has no home in the glass of your old-fashioned. In our other hand, we've got rye whiskey, which introduces a peppery bite that's a little bit spicier and less sweet than bourbon. Again, if we take a note from history, we learn that the original recipe called for sugar. It was actually first defined in print as spirit, bitters, sugar, and water. So you could definitely supplement the less sweet rye option and use simple syrup instead of a muddled sugar cube for a balanced twist. The jury's still out when it comes to a verdict in the rye versus bourbon debate, but we do know this. Whichever one you go with, you'll want something at least 90 proof or higher so your drink stands up to dilution from the melting ice. From all of us here at Total Wine & More, cheers to bourbon and rye. Thanks to our friends at Total Wine and More for today's A Spirited Debate. Where does public school education fit in this debate? 
the point is public school education is very important, especially because the teaching of history, the teaching of, about sexuality, the teaching about race has become a political firestorm in many states. Teachers who say in class some of the things that we three have said or four have uh, today could end up in jail for violating these new laws against the uh, quote unquote divisive issues. If you mention a divisive issue, let us say slavery, in an American history class in some states, you're violating the law, you know, and maybe it won't be in jail, but you can certainly be fined and sued by parents and all sorts of other things. So the whole question of how our history ought to be taught is very fraught, but it's very connected to this question of who we are. What are students being taught in classrooms about these very issues of identity and democracy, immigration, etc., that we have been talking about? It would be very unfortunate if the effort to redefine America in a much more conservative way became the official sort of curriculum in many parts of the country. In that, I think we have an example of the degree to which where we are right now is a political project, simply because there has been a, a recent study that actually looked at the way people wanted their children taught history. And most Americans, both Republicans and Democrats, want them to be taught what actually happened. The idea that we have to whitewash our history is very much coming from a group of people who are taking over the school boards and taking over right-wing states or our right-wing leaders taking over contested states. And that, again, brings, I think, for me, it brings us back to the relationship in our democracy between what people on the ground want, the vast majority of us on so many hot button issues, and how we are represented and how our representation is manipulated the way that Eddie identified at the very beginning of this conversation through gerrymandering and through the use of the Senate filibuster and all the different ways in which a small minority has managed to put itself in control of the lives of the rest of us. Yeah. And, you know, I think his name is Donald y Yocavani, or Yacovani. I can't pronounce his last Yacovani. name. Yacovani. Right. Yacovani has, has a new book out entitled Teaching White Supremacy. And he's engaged in this kind of survey of, of history textbooks used from the colonial period all the way up to now, right? And this is fascinating account of the way in which our history has been told. I mean, and, and thank God for, for Eric. How many editions has your history book been now, mm. Eric, for young folks? My textbook is coming out with its seventh edition shortly, so yeah. He is, after all, the most frequently cited author on college syllabi. But, you know, when you think about it, though, think about how long it took in high school history books for slavery to be talked about or Reconstruction to be talked about. Absolutely. And so there are ways in which a certain understanding of who we are, right, has been reproduced in the very ways in which we tell the story to our children or to our students. Right. And when we think about how the publishing industry in Texas has such a stranglehold on publishing, you know, high school and, and, and middle school uh, textbooks, it just shows you the political value and significance of what Professor Foner has done with his book and his work, uh, because because we're producing certain kinds of citizens when we tell the story in a certain sort of way. Well, I think just as Heather said about parents, students also want to hear a true history. You know, the idea that liberal or left-wing teachers are indoctrinating students, that's ridiculous. The students are smart enough to avoid being indoctrinated if that Absolutely. has happened. But <laughs> they do want divisive issues to be discussed. They do want new ideas, new perspectives, whether it's on slavery or Jim Crow or other things in the classroom. And young people have a role to play in fighting against the efforts to sort of take over these school boards, which uh, Heather mentioned. Exactly. And the attacks on teaching American history, I think, are part of a larger project of attacking the public good altogether. And remember that the replacement of public schools uh, is not simply in a vacuum. They will be replaced by right. segregation academies and Christian academies, which don't teach democracy. In their very structures, they teach the idea of an authoritarian system. And I actually worry a great deal about that between homeschooling, Christian academies, and 
segregation academies, we have a whole shadow version of education in this country that doesn't get the kind of attention it needs to. And that, of course, is what those people advocating vouchers, for example, for the most part, are, are advocating. I'm put in mind of, uh, I don't know if you read Maggie Haberman's biography of Trump, but where she says he actually sees hate as a civic good. <laughs> Man, this should be, and maybe it will be, or is, a semester course, not an hour-long podcast, but I guess it's a start. I'd like to maybe end with thoughts that are outside, perhaps, the heartland of your expertise, but I'll bet keep you up late at night anyway, which is just whatever thoughts the three of you might have about what a more perfect union, I, I guess I could say. What would a more perfect union look like and how might we get there? Let me just say that even though uh, I'm somewhat pessimistic at the moment about our political system, in a longer term sense, I'm more optimistic. I think what these recent elections just showed, even though, as I say, we can't throw our hats in the air and say, okay, no problem anymore, uh, is that a lot of people do believe in democracy in this country. And they responded when President Biden went on the campaign trail to talk about not just the uh, you know national debt or other specific issues of policy, but about democracy and how it's endangered and how people have to stand up for it. And I think that actually resonated because the contradiction that we have talked about throughout this session today is premised on the idea that America is and should be a multiracial democracy. And that that idea, you know, we're talking about the anti-people, but a lot of people take that seriously as part of the definition of who they are and what the United States is. So I, I do think we have to keep talking about these questions, not just get bogged down in very specific policy issues, but to make sure that the issue of the fate of democracy is on the political agenda. So I'm going to be coming here out of left field because for all that I spend my days talking about democracy and all that, if I could build a more perfect union tomorrow, the first thing I would do is is level the economic playing field. I would put tax rates among the very wealthy up to at least what they were in the 1960s and probably in the 1950s. And I would shore up the wages of people at the bottom. And the reason that I say that, it, which again seems coming from me like it's um, you know sort of a very mechanical thing, is that if you look at reforms in our society, they always come at times when people feel like their ability to put food on the table is secure. And we are in a, in a crazy moment now of the concentration of wealth upward for all the fact that the Republicans have gained so much power by complaining about the movement of wealth downward. In fact, the opposite has happened. We have a very few extraordinarily wealthy people. And when you have billions of dollars, you can buy elections and you can buy the Supreme Court and you can do all kinds of things that you couldn't if we had the Great Compression still, the one that we had from 1933 through 1981 that economists have identified instead of the Great Divergence, which has come since 1981. So, you know, that seems like a really mechanical thing, but that's where I would start is I would raise taxes on the extraordinarily wealthy. <laughs> so let me pan out just for a second. I think we're in a conjunctural moment. And it's a moment in which a particular ideology has revealed itself to my mind to be bankrupt. For the last 40 years, we've been living under the terms and assumptions of Reaganism. And it has produced all sorts of contradictions or exacerbated them. And we're trying to figure out what we're going to do next as this ideology flails about and those who are committed to it try to hold on to it as it's on life support. I'm interested in that demographic between 18 and 29 that showed up in the midterms, who are now, I call them members of the catastrophic generation. They've grown up in the midst of cascading crises. They know that the country isn't, doesn't work, and they will be open to the very things that Heather just laid out. They're going to be reaching, I think, for more imaginative ways to think about our being together. What that will look like, I'm not sure. But I also know that it's not just going to be them because there are a number of others in their cohort who are reaching for older languages like fascism. When we think about Charlottesville, when we think about the folks who are on the march in Europe, they're not baby boomers. They're Gen Zers and millennials. So we have this interesting 
moment in front of us. But I think part of what we have to do is untether, finally, untether our idea of democracy from this notion that it belongs to certain people who happen to be of a certain color, of a certain gender, of a certain sexual orientation, and a certain income. And we have to think about democracy in a different way. And that's going to require a broad cultural shift. How that happens, I'm not sure. But we're in a moment where something is collapsing and something is trying to be born. So it's a moment of crisis and possibility. So who knows what will happen? Eddie, Heather, Eric, it's an honor to learn with you. And I think the listeners will feel the same way. Thank you so much for this fascinating and really timely discussion. We are out of time for this special topical episode of Talking Feds. Thank you very much to Professors Eric Foner, Heather Cox Richardson, and Eddie Gloud. And thank you very much, listeners, for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts. And please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. You can also now subscribe to us on our YouTube channel, where we are posting full episodes, talking books, and lots of bonus video content. You can follow us on Twitter at TalkingFedsPod, and you can also join our Patreon at patreon.com slash TalkingFeds, where we post weekly discussions and monthly live Q&A sessions with me exclusively for supporters. This week, we posted a conversation with Chief Judge David Barron of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit about how courts look not only back to the enactment of the laws they are interpreting, but forward to the potential judgment of history in ruling, especially in landmark cases. Talking Feds is a completely independent production You may notice it's not larded up with commercials like so many other law and politics podcasts are. So if you like the work we do and the spirit moves you to support the show, joining our Patreon is the best way to do it. Submit your questions to questions at TalkingFeds.com, whether it's for Talking 5 or general questions about the inner workings of the legal system for our sidebar segments. Thanks for tuning in. And don't worry, as long as you need answers, the feds will keep talking. Talking Feds is produced by Olivia Henriksen. Sound engineering by Matt McArdle. Rosie Don Griffin and David Lieberman are our contributing writers. Production assistance by Laurel Feldner, David Littman, Emma Maynard, and Kalena Tano. Special thanks to Danny Cordray, Mark Greenberg, and Heather Cox Richardson. Our gratitude goes, as always, to the amazing Philip Glass, who graciously lets us use his music. Talking Feds is a production of Dolito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later. Mm-hmm.